Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's new digital startup hub. We have with us Sam Yegan, a uh, many-time founder and uh, the founder of OKCupid, Sparknotes, and now the CEO of Match Incorporated. Sam, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Sam, you have so many different companies, and we'll get a chance to talk to them, uh, talk about them. But you have your OK Cupid T-shirt on, and I know I saw earlier you uh, a great quote from you, which is, "I never want to be head of a company that I don't want to wear the T-shirt of." So it's good to see you in your OK Cupid T-shirt. Uh, for those who don't know, what is OK Cupid? OK Cupid started out as uh, uh, our vision was to build the biggest and best online dating business. At the time, we focused on the fact that we were free. Um, the, the industry was eHarmony, Match, and Yahoo back in 2004, and um, everyone kind of was taking the same approach. It was very psychologist-driven. It was, it, was, um, a, a it was a subscription model, and we looked and saw, thought there was a couple big opportunities. One was to make online dating work better. Okay. Um, I'm a math major. Um, all my, my business partners were math majors, and we fundamentally believed that no shrink, no psychologist was going to be the person to figure out dating at a global scale, that it had to ultimately be a number story. Um, number one. Number two, we thought that dating should be a positive, fun experience. Um, I've tried to sign up for eHarmony. I was rejected. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and then I rejected them because 432 questions or whatever it is is just too long. Um, it makes you feel, um, doesn't make you feel good to use the other products that are out of the mm -hmm. market. And so um, we said, okay, it could be better. At, at actually making matches, so it'd be more fun to use. And then uh, our, our experience at Sparknotes, um, offering a free product, um, we said, look, if we go out with a free product that's better and more fun to use, market could be ours. So, uh, now Sam, when we were preparing for this, one of the conversations we had was I, I asked you, how about you got into dating sites, and you, you told me about how your uh, grades, one of your teachers was interviewed. You know, <laughs> share that story, it's, because uh, I, I did ask, like, you know, having known you a little bit, and, I, I didn't think of the first business you would start. Well, it wasn't the first business you right. started, but it wasn't the first one to come to mind was dating sites. Right. So what, what, tell, tell the story if you would. Share a little bit. Sure. So I, was, uh, I, was, I spent most of my childhood in a, uh, in a town called Bourbon, Illinois, which uh, before the Bears took over was just a cornfield uh, about an hour south of here. Um, and so when, I sold, uh, when we sold OKCupid, okay um, the local Kinky Daily Journal was going to do a local boy does good kind of story. And so uh, they went and found one of my... Uh, uh, one of my junior high teachers, uh, Mrs. Resba, uh, who's my favorite teacher ever. And um, uh, it's a front page story, by the way, in, this, in, this, in the Kinky Daily Journal. And uh, so they went and they found her, they tracked her down, and they're like, so what do you think of, of Sam sold this company for a lot of money? Like, what do you think? Um, and uh, she, said, she said, Sam was one of the best students I ever had. Um, I'm not at all surprised that he's successful. Uh, but she's like, I wouldn't have pegged him as a dating expert. Um, <laughs> and so, so it's, uh, it's uh, I think my junior high teacher and my wife are the two most surprised people in the world that I'm a dating expert. Maybe my mom, too, but um, that's, uh, those three people are probably pretty surprised. Well, your mom's here, so. Yes, she is. Um, so, growing up in Bourbon, what was, what was your experience like? Tell, me, tell, tell us a little about your child. Were you, were you obviously an entrepreneur in, in the making, or you know, what, how did those experiences shape what, what you've ended up doing? Yeah, I mean, I had a... Uh, you know, I think I had a very, um, uh, I had a great childhood. I think it was um, um, normal, um, it, it sort of in a, in a, in sort of the positive sort of, um, sort of Midwestern sense of that word. It was, I think it was, um, you know, I went to local, pu the local public schools. Um, I had a nice house at the yard and, you know, played basketball, you know, with my friends from, you know, I know, Jeremy, you're laughing because you know I'm not a good basketball player. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you know, but, um, uh, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a normal, fun childhood. I think people often ask whether, did I have a lemonade stand? Did I have a paper route? Or where did the entrepreneurial sort of zeal come from? And, um, you know, I've given that a lot of thought as I've, uh, you know, as I've sort of been an entrepreneur for 15 years. And I, I don't, I can't actually trace any, other than sort of being willing to sort of try new things, I, I never had a lemonade stand or a paper route, but I, I do think um, that there's really something to be said for um, you know being the son of immigrants as it applies to being as it sort of impacts you being an entrepreneur because I think um, in many ways immigration can be the ultimate entrepreneurship if you think about sort of sort of betting 
you know, as against the certainty of a job and a paycheck, the certainty of being in an environment that you know, a language you know, and a family you know, and putting that all into the middle of the table and saying, I'm going to go somewhere totally new and make a bet that has really uncertain returns in the future. I think that's a lot of what entrepreneurship is. It's taking a risk. And did you, did you feel that growing up? Um... I, I don't think I did consciously. I think, um, you know, sort of the attitudes that my family really instilled in me about being willing to sort of what's important to sort of the, the willingness to take risks and things like that. Um, I think all, I don't think it was ever framed as entrepreneurship or, or mm -hmm. anything like that. Uh, but I think in retrospect, when I think about how I think about risk and think about what's important, uh, I think that does all tie back. And your parents are accomplished professionals um, moving from Syria to Bourbon A. Okay. That's probably not the most common route no, to Bourbon probably A. Not. Um, probably not. What, um, why Bourbon A and, and, and how was that experience? Um, my dad first came to go to college. Um, he went to the University of Tennessee. He was a computer scientist. And um, then uh, he went back and married my mom and they moved over. And um, my mom was, uh, they had lived in Chicago. I was born actually in the city. And then my mom uh, got a chance to uh, practice medicine down in Kankakee. And so we moved down there and the rest is uh, history. And you, uh, um, and you went to IMSA, the Illinois Math and science. I went from the cornfield in the southern suburbs to the cornfields in the western suburbs. <laughs> yeah. and, and what was that experience like? That was, um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in luck. I think, um, I, think, I think anyone who sits in this chair and doesn't attribute at least some of their success to luck I think is kidding themselves. But I also believe that you have to put yourself in the position to get lucky and then you have to execute on the chance you've had um, when, when luck calls. And uh, I kind of look at IMSA that way. It's, I, was, I was at a normal median high school down in Bourbon A, I think. Um, you know, I think the valedictorian of Bradley Bourbon Community High School goes to Northwestern, and Northwestern's a great school, but like, it's all within the, this construct of Illinois. Like, no one ever left the state. It was all like, what do you value in Northwestern? That was your choice. Um, two great schools. Um, but I think the, the going to IMSA, where all of a sudden, you know, not just from academic opportunities were, were, were totally different, but um, the ability to just do independent research. I took seven physics classes wow. in three years. And just as a, you know, we were, we were challenged constantly in a way that just um, hadn't been, and started to experience failure, which I think is such an important part of entrepreneurship. Um, I don't think I'd ever gotten anything, I don't think I'd ever even gotten an A minus, um, you know, in, in Bourbon A. Um, but I, it, it wasn't the second day I was at IMSA, I realized I wasn't the smartest kid there. Um, and as a 14 year old, that's a, that, that can be a really tough thing to hear, but better to know at 14 you're not the smartest you know, person around than to find out you know, in your mid 20s that you're not the smartest person right. around. And I think learning that, you start to say, well, okay, well, I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be the best that way. And you start failing. Right. So you, uh, but you didn't, you did pretty well. You didn't fail good into college. I did that's for sure. I mean, <laughs> I, but that's the thing is like, you know, I didn't have, like, my GPA, in, at, my GPA at, at IMSA wasn't. The best, um, and I think um, I got into Harvard because they saw I like I knew that I wasn't going to be the best student at IMSA, and so all of a sudden you had to start. It forced you to say, okay, well, what am I good at? And at a very early age, I was sort of realizing, thinking about those kinds of questions. And what was what was that like? What what did you what what are those kind of decisions or understandings you came at at IMSA that helped propel you to be able to go to Harvard without the being the valedictorian? Um, I think I think a lot of it was um, tr really ensuring that I wasn't taking the safe path. Um, you know, there were easy classes to take that sort of guarantee you the best grades, and then there are sort of the chance to just try lots of different classes to um, really invest in sort of developing leadership skills to join a lot of the extracurriculars and, mm -hmm. and, and those things, which I guess now are sort of college application 101. You do that, and you get the 4.0, and you run all the clubs. But, um, you know, I think back in the 90s when I was in school, you know, there was, you know, there was less of that. And right. so I think it was diversifying kind of earlier on and uh, getting involved in a lot of other things. And uh, a lot of physics there. Yeah. But you didn't pursue physics as a college major. No, I didn't. What, uh, what drew you to physics so much at that age? Oh, um, well, it's the Math and Science Academy. And so, um, you know, there are so many science offerings. And I think just among sort of, they had computer science, but again, this was a long time ago, and there's a lot more computer science there now. But as between, as among chemistry, physics, and, and biology, I just was drawn to physics immediately, uh, probably because of the mathematical, the more mathematical underpinnings. So you get to you get to Harvard, and uh, did you pick a major right away? Did you find your way to it? What um, I I enrolled uh, in a in a computer science course, um, computer science fifty uh, at the time, uh, my first my first semester there. I 
little bit of luck again in picking that. I didn't go kind of with that draw. Um, and that was, that was, turned out to be a turning point for me, which we can talk about if you want, but um, yeah. uh, that class probably, again, so many things are, the, are things I look back on and say, wow, that was transformational. Um, but I took this computer science class that I, I fell in love with um, and really. This, this is a really famous class. I mean, I was at Harvard two years ago uh, and uh, visiting, doing a benchmarking thing for Northwestern, and 50% of Harvard graduates now take CS50. They have a t-shirt. Oh, yeah. CS50 t-shirt. I mean, this is, it's amazing. Should have worn that t-shirt instead of this Exactly. Um, yeah, so I, I took that class, and, um, and sort of by the end of my first year, at, um, in my first year, I kind of realized that um, I loved the math, and I loved the computer science, and so there was a major called, and I loved economics, and there was a major called applied math um, that allowed you to kind of get a really strong mathematical focus counted computer science toward the major, and you got to sort of focus on a subject, which was economics for me. So I kind of, again, had the diversity um, rather than going super deep in any category. Also, I'm not smart enough to be a physics major. <laughs> well, the, uh, so you, you're taking this, um, you, you're, you're taking these classes, you're doing, pursuing things that you are find intellectually interesting, you're passionate about, and then in your free time, you started a company? Who has free time at Harvard to start with? I have to imagine. Uh, it's pretty well, busy, especially with the kind of course load you were taking. Yeah. Um, you know, it was one of those things where um, the freshman dean's office at Harvard put me, um, you know, had as one of my roommates this guy, Max, who's, you know, the smartest guy ever, I've ever met. And across the hall was this guy, Chris, second smartest guy I've ever met. Uh, he hates it when I say that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, Ma Max and Chris uh, are, are just these two guys who are two of my very best friends in the world. And um, they're just incredibly brilliant, and um, and we became really good friends. And um, you know, you have to put yourself back in the mindset of 1998, uh, 1999, when um, you know the internet had been around for long enough that it was clear that it was a thing and it was big and um, it had a bright future. But it also was so early in its development that ideas that are otherwise obvious hadn't been done yet. Um, and so. Uh, uh, on Thanksgiving Day of, of my senior year, Chris sent, sent me an email saying, hey, I just uh, reserved this domain called thespark.com. Um, you should check it out. And he'd put up like a purity test. There's 100 questions, and it was just yes, no. Have you done this? Have you done that? And at the end, it told you your purity score. That was it. it was like, they, used to do it on, they used to do it on pen and paper in high school, and now he put it on the internet. So it was a huge contribution to society. <laughs> um, and, um, and I was like, and I literally, I remember looking at it, I was like, OK. And I like went back to study for my finals. I was like, okay, well, uh, or, or whatever. That's, that's this is nothing. Um, and then, um, and he's he's really great at thinking about like virality. And, and so, thousands of people started taking this test. Tens of thousands of people. And then in January, he mailed me. He's like, hey, check this out. And he put up some um, humor articles, kind of like the Onion. I uh, so started putting up these articles. Um, and he's like, yeah, like, there's half a million people, you know, every month who come and read this content. And I was like, oh, that's a big number. Um, and so that's kind of how we went down the path. So, of, of so starting the just company. for those of us who um, don't get a half million users on something, just on, oh, again, that wasn't me. That was all Chris who did so that on his own. What What were some of the secrets that you, you learned or, or you saw there? In the... it, it was it was um, you know this was still uh, we we have this this inside joke called FTAFT, which is forward to a friend technology, which is just like getting someone to write an email, and that's what you did back in the day. You're like you like get someone to like cut and paste this link and you'd like the call to action was email your friend this link and so people would be like cut and paste take this purity test um, and so that's what it, it was really just about immediately Chris is drawn to thinking about how do you get people to sort of mechanically and systematically you know talk about and promote your your product and of course that's seen so many iterations now with Facebook platform and on mobile and all this stuff but uh, I think you know he was one of the first to really really understand viral marketing um, Interesting. on the internet. And so you've got the half million visitors, you have the onion type content, yep. and where does it go from there? Um, so uh, we, uh, so this is January now of our senior year, and um, I'm doing on-campus recruiting, because as far as I'm concerned, I'm just getting a job, and I've got you know, college loans, and uh, I gotta have a real job. Um, and so uh, I, I end up signing uh, uh, an offer letter with a, with a Chicago-based consulting firm. I was gonna move back and be a consultant. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's March, and, um, and you know, Chris like, sends me another email about the spark, and he's like, you know, so he and Max and I are, are hanging out, we're grabbing, uh, grabbing dinner, and, um, and we finally just started talking pretty seriously. It's one of those things where the meeting wasn't called to get serious about it, but we just started talking about what was happening, and he's like, 
I think we should do this. I was like, what do you mean? We should, what, what, is, what do you mean do this? And he's like, we should start a company. Um, and so it, we just kind of decided to do it without doing a ton of, there was no business planning, there was no fundraising, there was none of the things that you would do now. We just said, we're seniors. And, and again, this was back in the time where I was like, well, what do you have to lose, really? Um, worst case scenario, uh, you know, I just took another job. So what was it that lit that though? Because you said you went to dinner just to yeah. have dinner. It wasn't yeah. the agenda and you leave the dinner saying, let's start a company. I, what, what was the magic that happened? I think the magic was really just thinking that it, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. That you have this thing that is growing on its own um, and the internet is this un, still very unknown thing. Um, and so it was like working with my friends on something that is growing in this, in this space that's really interesting to us. Uh, and, and I don't think we understood the risk. I don't think we understood that there were tens of thousands or more of people having the same conversation saying, what do I have to lose? Worst case scenario, I'm a CEO of a startup that failed. Well, the world's now littered with you know, people who in the 90s started bad internet companies and ended up, that wasn't a ticket to business school as I thought it might be. Um, so we just kind of decided to do it. Uh, I had a little bit of a safety net in that I got my consulting firm to defer my offer um, for a year. Um, so that was nice, so that I knew that it sort of, I had a year to, figure this out and still yeah, nice job. Optionality. Um, and, uh, and I don't think I've heard of any other company funded this way, but the, uh, sort of the first capital into our business was I took the signing, the, the, the signing bonus from my consulting firm and I deposited it right into our, into our company's bank account. So $7,000 was my signing bonus um, and uh, $7,000 was in our bank account. And that was where we started. Nice. It's a whole new, new level of bootstrap. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so I won't tell you about the 401k account that my parents very like dutifully like funded for me for years and then I took the money out and put that into my company too. That's probably, that's well, probably worse. Well, I've heard Chris Sackett describe the story of how he, uh, he actually took his money he lent for Georgetown Law School, his student loans, and used it to fund his company. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, perfect. That one, you probably need to finish law school to get yourself out of that's that right. problem. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, so here you are. You got, you got the company started. It became something very different, though. Talk about that evolution. Uh, we were, I think, we are one of the first companies uh, to pivot before our company was even incorporated. So we decided to do the business kind of in, in January, February. We didn't actually get the incorporation filed until March. Um, and in that time, we sort of had this like, either brilliant or lucky insight, which is the content business is hard. Uh, the entertainment humor business is hard. Think about your favorite shows, Saturday Night Live or whatever. They have bad seasons. They have bad shows for sure, bad seasons, bad stretches. Um, and we knew very early on we didn't want to be under the gun of being funny every day, being entertaining every day because that wasn't scalable, that wasn't, that wasn't long-term right. sustainable. And so, I remember vividly, we were sitting in, um, in Chris's dorm room, and um, we were like, well, what are we gonna do? We have all these users, uh, you know, they're all mostly high school and college students. We're like, what are we gonna do? Um, what else can we offer these people that's a better business than humor? And uh, Chris, like me, uh, uh, math guy, hadn't maybe read all the English books he was supposed to in his English <laughs> classes. And uh, had on his uh, had on his shelf all these Cliff's notes, and Max just kind of looked up at them and was like, "We should do Cliff's notes." All right. So how many people here remember Cliff's notes? Oh, everybody. Good. Just checking. Just you know, generally. But how many how many of you how many have used a Spark note? That's there you go. Um, and so um, and so it was one of those things where we didn't do any market sizing or competitive analysis. It was just like Spark notes, and we like walked out of that meeting and we're like, "We're going to do Spark notes," and we made. Um, you know, we, we called some of our best friends who were English majors and we said, hey, I know you just did a, literally this one woman of our, friend of ours, she had just written a se summa senior thesis, senior thesis on uh, Moby Dick. And we're like, will you write a spark note? And she's like, I've just paid $120,000 to write papers for four years, now you're gonna pay me to write a paper? She's like, this is, this is a great, this is great. And so um, over spring break, uh, March, spring break in March of 1999, we had 10 of our friends write spark notes, put them up on the site and uh, Immediately inundated with hate mail from all these students for whom we didn't have the note they needed. Uh, they were like, you, you know, where's Romeo and Juliet? Where's Hamlet? Where's all these titles I need? Like, I hate you, Spark Notes. Um, and and I think that was um, that was you know that's the best kind of hate mail to get, of course. And so, spent the summer um, ramping up, and there you go. And what was it that made you said you, know, you talked about why Spark Notes was different, and I think you talked about the Fs, and sure. the reasons why. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. If you think about Cliff's Notes, um, they are, they are um, most importantly, they're unavailable when you need them. The think Cliff's Notes, the paper version, 1998. They're sold in a bookstore. The bookstore closes at like 8 o'clock. Um, and 
so you can't, and you're, if you're using a cliff note, you're probably doing it late at night, the night before your papers do. So you're <laughs> like, okay, well, crap. Where, where's the cliff note when I need it? Um, it's not searchable. Uh, you, ho you hope the index is good, but you know, it's, not, it's not searchable. It's, um, it's still linear content. It's hard to get what you need. Um, it's expensive. In the world of a college student, it's $5. That's a beer you can't have. Um, if you're, if you're, you know, it's like grades or beer, and you, know, you don't want to put any college student in that dilemma. Um, and, um, and then finally, the tone is so dry. And it so dry. it's like some, you know, just dry and, and not fun to use. And so we said, well, look. They hired um, professors instead of students, I think. Yeah, exactly. And so we said, look, if we can get, um, if, we can, if we can make the content better, more relevant, written by people who are just as smart, but just writing in a more modern, relevant tone, um, if we can make it available 24-7 digitally uh, through the web, and if we can give it away for free, then I sort of said, well, if you look at free fun effective is like my three Fs, even though I know there's either two or four Fs, depending on how you count, um, <laughs> but not three. Um, if, you, if, you, if you think of it that way, then which side of that competition do you want to be on? Would you rather be, on this, uh, would you rather be promoting the product that's more expensive, lower quality, and less fun, or the product that's free, fun, and effective? And of course, you take the free, fun, and effective. And I think Cliff's Notes was just never, ever able to react. And I think that's true of a lot of legacy businesses. They see this insurgent, disruptive company, and immediately um, they freeze up. And if you think about it, Cliff's Notes isn't an editorial company. Cliff's Notes is a company that excels at printing books in China, putting them on a boat, and putting them on trucks to retail, retail stores. That's what they do. They're a, logistics, they're a printing and logistics company. And so when faced with a technology company that understands editorial, they didn't, it wasn't a fair fight. So talk about the growth and, and what happened uh, with Spark Notes in terms of it's taken off. Yes. Give, for those who remember but maybe don't know the business side of the story. Yeah, so um, you know, the, first, the first Spark Note went up in, um, in March, like I said, March of 99. Uh, uh, by September, we had launched 100 titles. And by the following school year, by the school year that started 2000, we, were the, we had taken over as the majority, um, as the larger, we'd taken over the majority market share from CliffsNotes. Wow. Not in terms of revenue, but in terms of usage. Um, because again, it's just the distribution through, through the internet was so high. Um, and in that time period, we had, we had raised a little round of financing, a quarter million dollars, and uh, we'd sold the company uh, 11 months after we found it. Wow. And talk about the sale a little bit. Um, the sale was, uh, it was, it was crazy. Uh, it was crazy because I was 23 and didn't know what I was doing. It was crazy because we were, we got our first acquisition offer in October. So that was uh, uh, seven months after we started the company. We were getting like real, uh, real offers. I remember, I remember vividly, um, like I'm doing the negotiation by myself. Like we didn't have a banker involved in this. Like I was just doing it. And I remember I was, uh, my, uh, my parents and I, our family used to go to Las Vegas for brunch, uh, uh, Las Vegas for Thanksgiving every year because there was a medical conference there. And I remember sitting at the Paris Hotel uh, at brunch, uh, Thanksgiving brunch with, uh, with my family and um, got a call uh, from the acquirer. And I said, I got to take this. And I walked out and we agreed to like the final term. And I walked back to brunch. I was like, I just sold our company. And I remember my parents being like, what? That's so crazy. Like, what? How does that? <laughs> it doesn't just happen. Um, but, um, but yeah, so the, we negotiated the deal. Just um, I did it all, by, when I say by myself, you know, with my co-founders. Uh, but without any professional help, and uh, that was both good and bad. I think we, we uh, there were a bunch of things I got wrong in that negotiation, but um, it was Any big lessons crazy. learned from doing that that you've carried forward? Um, I think the biggest lesson learned was actually in the financing going into it. Um, we had done a quarter million dollar round for 10% of our company, um, and then there was something called a warrant for another $250,000 for another 10% of our company. And at the time, and I'm not saying I got swindled, um, I just got out negotiated. Um, the, uh, the investors were like, uh, I was like, well, what is this warrant thing? And they were like, oh, well, that's just to make your next round of financing easier. So whenever you need the money, you just call us, and we've already got the terms. We just wire you the next 250. I was like, oh, that sounds like a great structure. Whoever invented these warrants, they should like, <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. And so, um, and so we had an LOI signed. We signed the LOI right around Thanksgiving. Um, and then, but we were running low on cash because uh, the deal closed in, in February. And I remember thinking, oh, we're running out of cash. This is bad for negotiation, you know, as we negotiate all these deal terms. Warrants, great news. So I call up our investors. I'm like, hey, you know those warrants you've got? Why don't you exercise them and give us the quarter million dollars that we need? It'll be great leverage. They're like, no. Well, why would we do that? I was like, but we have an LOI signed. Like, no, we'll wait. So then I was like, okay, well, that's fine. I'm not going to get diluted. So <coughs> if we get through this thing, I'll make 10% more. Of course, they exercise their warrants the day of the close. And I was like, well, why didn't you exercise the, the warrants six days earlier when we needed them? 
So that was my biggest lesson was, you know, and it's just business. Like, it's not, they didn't screw me. Uh, but, you know, when you're, in a, when you're in a sort of high stakes financial transaction, you just have to expect everyone to be really looking out for themselves, not necessarily looking out for, um, you know, what's best for right. the company. So that was, that was the biggest thing there. Um, I think in terms of the, um, uh, I think in terms of the actual negotiation, um, you know, we we had a, we had we got about half the money up front, about half the money in an earnout. So there's just a lot of earnout dynamics that you have to think about, and um, always tough, which are tough. Um, and you know, in in the three transactions I've had, we've had two earnouts, and um, you know, one earnout went okay, and one earnout went great. So I think as long as you structure them right, you're dealing with people with with respectable, good people. I think it tends to be okay. Yeah, it's interesting. You sometimes seen earnouts though where people don't factor in what the the sale does to the momentum in their company. It can totally change it. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, so you 23, you sold your company. Do you feel comfortable sharing what you sold it for? We sold it for. Uh, it was a total of 30. Um, it was about again half up front, about half in an earnout. So, and then what happens after close? You have this earn out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we close, and again, uh, look. The story of this talk is luck and failure, uh, which. Uh, but then again, positioning yourself for luck and then executing on it um, and recovering from failure. Um, and look, we, we sold the company in, in, um, in February of 2000. And I had friends who were raising money at these astronomical valuations instead of selling. You know, they, had, they had acquisition offers on the one hand and they had fundraising, they had VCs on the other hand. Um, and I'm not smarter than any of them. It's not like I knew, the, the, I knew the April 20th or whenever the market crashed and kind of the, the, the bubble was, first was on. But it wasn't 60 days. It was... You know, we got out 60 days before the market crashed. That was, that was luck. That was luck. I think, you know, so, so really what happened was the market crashed in April and the world changed. Um, again, you have to really put yourself back in this mindset. So, um, uh, so we had this earn out going and we were, we were still crushing it. Our business was still doing great and we were, we were hitting all of our numbers. Um, but the acquirer, the acquirer stock um, went down, ended up going down 95%. Wow. Through the course of that year, they went from being a uh, well, maybe it's about who'd 90%. you sell it to? A company called iTurf, um, which uh, which um, is was the online portal for the inter for the clothing retailer Delia's, which is this uh, mm -hmm. clothing retailer for for girls. Um, and uh, oh, it's market crashes. We're still doing great, and it turns out that there was a clause. And I and again, I'd like to say that I brilliantly negotiated this, but we put a clause in the deal that said if their stock price ever went below two dollars. Um, the earn out, which was payable in stock, became payable in cash. Wow. Um, which, of course, they should never have agreed to because that's just, if the stock's crashing, probably they are in a cash crunch. Um, but whatever, it's great for us. And so um, we're just trucking along, trucking along. Their stock price goes below $2. Their CFO goes into the CEO and is like, just FYI, we're looking at a you know, $15 million cash obligation to these guys in, well, 60 days. Um, that turns out it's bad. Um, so uh, CEO uh, calls me into, uh, into his office and um, basically... And he, and you're working there. Yeah, I'm still working there. Yeah, we're, there we're, is a we're certain irony in, in coming in with that kind of leverage to the... Yeah, <laughs> well, well it, was, it was unclear. It was, you know, it was kind of unclear who had the leverage, right? So he basically said, um, and you know, we'll paraphrase here, but he basically said, look, um, you need to renegotiate our deal or else your servers might get unplugged. Um, because he basically said, I'm not going to pay this earn out, and if we have to, you know, if we have to get nasty about it, we're willing to get nasty about it. A little ethically challenged. And, well, you know, um, yeah, I mean, ethically challenged It's probably true. Um, and, uh, and so I remember I got, uh, I got on the Delta shuttle, because uh, the Spark was still based in New York. I, uh, in Boston, I had moved to New York at the time. And I got on the Delta shuttle, and I, um, and I flew to Boston, and... Uh, we ordered pizza and, and, and had like two liters of Coke everywhere in the office. And we were just like, now what do we do? You know, we, like we, we have this claim to this earn out, but we also have like this, do you really want to be litigating with a company that might be going out of business? Like, is that, like, is that a good strategy? Um, and this kind of comes to again an e-donkey, like litigation, like is this great, is this, we live in this great country with this great legal system, but like, you know, it's not always the case that the litigation option is viable, is economically or, 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 or business viable. And so we basically said we have to negotiate. And so it's your point, you know, who had the, le who had the leverage? It's just unclear because it, I, litigation was, I don't think, was really a good option for us. And so we ended up re restructuring our deal. They paid us some cash, and, um, and they basically presented us with a choice, um, which is either we'll give you your business back 
um, or we'll sell it and we will split the proceeds 50-50, whatever, whatever we sell. Um, and this, I'm pretty confident, is the biggest mistake of my career, um, which was um, we either didn't have the vision or didn't have the guts to take our business back at that time. We ended up selling the business for three and a half million, down from 30, so 90% decline in a year. Um, and we, we should have known the internet was coming back. The internet wasn't going anywhere. We would have had to fire all of our employees. We would have had to retrench because we had lost revenue, ad revenue was down. We, but for a penny, literally a nickel on the dollar, we could have still made a ton of money and then head back this platform, which you saw how many people in the audience like raised their hand. People were using Spark Notes. It was this thing we could have launched all future businesses from. We would have owned it outright. It would have been this annuity of cash going forward. But we would have had to make the tough decision of firing people um, and running the business kind of back as a startup. And we didn't. We didn't. We agreed to sell the company to Barnes & Noble for three and a half million, um, which, again, had its own advantages for me career-wise in terms of getting some time in a big company. But it was a huge, huge uh, economic mistake. And what do you think... You ever think about what it might have been? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, whenever Max and Chris and I get back together, you know, whenever we get together, we're just like, uh, don't we wish we owned Spark Notes? Um, you know, it would it would have been great. I mean, I think we would we would have a business now that is one of the leading brands. I'm talking to any any college campus. In fact, uh, when my brother, quick story, my brother uh, showed up at college the first day. He just wore a Spark Notes T-shirt. Just they were doing like some outdoor adventure and shape. and literally his classmates who he'd never met before carried him on his shoulders, on their shoulders, and said, thank your brother for Spark Notes. We wouldn't be at Harvard without, without him. Um, and so you know, when you think about that kind of passion around a brand, yeah, I wish I owned that. Um, yeah. you know, something like 10 million students use it every year. And you know, when we went to launch OkCupid, what a great place to launch any new product. It would be just to, to own this asset. Well, um, the amaz amazing thing is you see with Facebook, as since college students then become professionals and move on to the workforce, exactly. it has this per perpetual nature to yeah, it. Yeah, and I'm not saying we would have been Wikipedia, but like the, the, one of the last things we thought about you know, before we all left Barnes & Noble was you know, we should turn this from this resource that's, you know, that is all about you know, academic content to just general content that people contribute to. And again, I'm not saying we would have had their success, but like we were thinking about those kinds of things, right. about how do you become a general encyclopedia and... Do you think you've made any other decisions differently because of that? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm sure the answer is yes, uh, although I've never been asked that, and I can't think of any off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but I, but I'm sure, I'm sure I have. So, you go to Barnes and Noble. I think if nothing else, when I talk to entrepreneurs, I think there's this, and one of the first things I say at every Accelerator TechStars class is. You don't have to be, like, success is not defined by raising institutional capital and going down the venture path and having an exit. There's nothing, lifestyle business is a pejorative term, but I wish I had a business that just sped out a couple million dollars of cash every year. Like, call that a lifestyle business if you want. I would take, I'll take that. You know, and I think, I think Spark Notes would have been, quote, unquote, a lifestyle business, I think, for us. And I now encourage people, like, if you think you, if you, think you can build a business, you know, capital efficiently that spits out cash, that's, you know. That's great. And so I think that's certainly one where I've advised people very differently, um, sort of just always wishing I had that business myself. Interesting. Um, we were talking about the cycle. I was, uh, so Dave, Dave was with David Sachs the other day, uh, and uh, you know, one of the things he talked about is, of course, them selling PayPal. Sure. And uh, you know, this whole question, and um, you know, Mike Moritz, who's the great Sequoia, legendary. legendary Sequoia investor, he was against them selling it. And the reason, and he's never sold any stock in which he didn't have to sell. And of course, now you look at what PayPal could have been, um, and you look at what you know—it's a thirty-two billion dollar, probably sure. forty billion dollar market cap. They sold for a billion five. But when you ask David about the sale, like why they sold it, what they were doing, you know, they had been through sort of such a hair-raising experience, and you know, they were they were paying people to become customers. Um, and so there is this element of sort of what you experience at the time inevitably influences in a way that hindsight doesn't heal. I think there's an inherent myopia that, it's, that sets in. Not, again, not in I guess it's negative in retrospect, but I think you, the entrepreneurs often live in the moment so much and think that's part of the responsibility of having a great board, which we didn't have a board at Sparknotes. I mean, I'm sure we had a formal board, but we didn't have a, a value-add board. Right. 
Uh, and I think that perspective is, is something that's so, that's so hard because you're looking at what do you have to do today um, and what is this thing that just happened to me, this sort of recency bias that I think sets in for so many people that it's sometimes hard to say, well, what's happening in the world and what's my 10-year view on this business? And I think sometimes that can be really hard to it keep is. Just, Well, the emotional nature of it is hard. I mean, you just can't, you can't be purely rational um, when you're, you're so, right. put so much into these businesses right. uh, as much as you'd like to be. So, so now you go to eDonkey. Um, talk a little bit about what was eDonkey. Um, you started it, um, I think, what, in about 2003? 2003. 2003? 2004, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> my path to eDonkey um, was, uh, uh, was an interesting one. I, I had left Barnes & Noble after the year that I, that I had to work there. And, um, uh, and here I was. I was, uh, I guess at this point I am 25. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just get a job. Yeah, whatever, see what happens and get some experience. Uh, so I wasn't, like, it wasn't yet in my blood that I was going to be a serial entrepreneur. I was like, I can you know, get a job. And uh, here I was thinking, I'm a 25, you know, three years of experience, and the only thing on my resume is CEO. And I was like, that makes me, I mean, I'm going to be the best applicant for any job. <laughs> I mean, I've been a CEO, you know, uh, what else could you want? Um, and so I applied to, like, all these jobs. I didn't know that you have to network to get a job. So I just, like, went to probably Monster at the time, and I'm just, like, submitting resumes to all these, like, analyst positions, being a CEO. And I'm like, slam dunk for these jobs. Um, I got exactly zero callbacks. Um, I, my uh, buddy who founded Net Gravity, John Danner, told me about three years in, he said, uh, when I done my first startup, he said, congratulations, you are now formally unemployed. Yeah, and, and, uh, and no one will hire you for a regular job right. ever again. And, and they don't now, want you. And now running a big company, I'm just trying to imagine a 25-year-old CEO coming into our org and be like, be a disaster. Like, what are they going to like? The manager of this and reports, it's a disaster. And, um, and of course, I had, no, I had no idea at the time. And so I'm like, how come no one's calling me back? And so I was, I was unemployable for the first of many times in my life, I think. Um, I was unemployable. And, um, and so I did what you do, which is, you know, be, be creative. And it turns out that a, a, a friend of one of my very good friends was starting this company called eDonkey. He had already, he's the true founder. He had already, um, he had already written all the code for it, but hadn't really commercialized it yet. He had the software for, if you kind of remember Napster in the late 90s, um, and then the second generation of, of file sharing software was like Kazaa, Grokster, LimeWire, BearShare, and eDonkey was one of those. Um, and he, we met for lunch at this Cuban restaurant in Manhattan, and he said, um, here's this thing. I've got this great technology. It's awesome, and I've got some users. Uh, I don't know what to do with it, though. And he said, you seem to know what to do with users. You know how to monetize them and build businesses around them, so let's, let's team up. And so uh, in part because I thought it was a cool technology and a great opportunity that I liked being an entrepreneur, in part because no one else was calling me back for other jobs. Uh, I was like, yeah, let's take that job. Um, and so uh, Jed and I became, uh, became business partners. And uh, it was such a different experience running, um, running eDonkey. At, you know, at, at, in a typical company, you want to get as much press as possible. At eDonkey, you know, we were in this gray area of intellectual property law, but you know, is file sharing legal? Is it not legal? Is it is copyright infringement? Is it not? And so we actually, we actually didn't seek press. Uh, and Kazaa was kind of the... The, the big beast in the U.S. They were the ones that the recording industry was going after every day. Um, and, then, uh, and then there was this one day, I think in March, where um, this, uh, this firm in the U.K. put out this, put out this report that um, eDonkey had eclipsed Kazaa as the largest file sharing network in the world, uh, citing that 30% of all the internet traffic in Europe was consumed by our product. Wow. That's um, unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, and terrible. Uh, so I, you know, usually you get that kind of press. You're like, we're the biggest in the world. High fives, you know, happy hour. Let's, you know, let's celebrate. How many lawyers like, start chasing? And I was right like, away. oh, this is going to be a disaster because now we are, you know, we've sort of taken the, we've taken the, you know, the bullseye off Kaza and put it on our own backs and, and say, you know, come get us. Um, and so, you know, I think we made the decision kind of early on, uh, for better or for worse. Like, all most of the other file sharing companies were pretty shady. They were, so they sort of operated. Offshore, they were, I mean, I think to this day, the founders of, of Kazaa can't come into the country. The founders of, you know, they're, they're kind of all over the place. Um, and, uh, you know, and a bunch of the other guys are just like literally in basements, places that they don't want to. And so I was like, look, we're, we're, let's do, Jed and I were like, let's do this differently. Let's be the upstanding ones. Let's like, we're in New York. Like, let's do business. Let's try to do business with people. And so we started an industry trade group that lobbied um, Congress. We, um, uh, I negotiated with, with CEOs of record labels, like, I was like, look, 
like I, a person who would like to come and I'll even wear like a nice jacket for you and I'll sit in your nice conference room and we can sign a contract that we're willing to abide by and we'll do business together. Your alternative is to like deal with the pirates. Um, and I really thought that would be a compelling argument. Um, turns, out it, turns out it wasn't. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was sitting well, well, it was compelling to people, maybe not in the recording not industry, the recording but look industry. where they ended up. Well, that's right. Um, and uh, and, and I, I, was, I was at my lawyer's office negotiating. They might be saying to themselves, biggest mistake I made was this guy Sam Yagen came to see me. It was my chance to get it right. I don't know about that. I don't think they like me very much over there. So I doubt they're, I doubt they're uh, well, hoping to Well, but they, all, they all wish they'd, they'd figured something out better. Probably. I think that's right. I think that's right. And so I was, I was, at, I was, at, my, I was at my law firm figuring out like litigation strategy. Um, and uh, I walked down. Big not, not, by the way, not something that most tech CEOs spend a lot of time on. No, uh, and I would advise you not uh, if, if you have the choice. And I, I remember I came down the elevator and I was checking my voicemail and uh, it was the Wall Street Journal. And so I, I called them back and I was like, what, what's going on? She's like, can you confirm you've been sued by the recording industry? And I was like, no. <laughs> but I was like, I bet she's not wrong. And so it was like the longest, it was like the longest, longest five minute subway ride of my life. I was just like, oh God, what's waiting for me at the office? And sure enough, I walk in and she's like, there's a FedEx on your desk. And I'm like, I open it up, and there it is. Um, you know, sort of the formal communication from the uh, from the record industry, and so that sort of set off a, a one-year process where we um, sort of negotiated and 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 and, um, and battled, and I ended up testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which was um, one of those sort of bucket list things, cool to do once. I never <laughs> ever want to do again. Um, it was it was it was it was yet another disaster. Um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, we settled and. Um, you know, you can do your internet research for that. It's probably the only thing I can't really talk a lot, uh, talk about very candidly here. But um, it was, you know, we settled, and it was, um, it was certainly uh, uh, not an economic success uh, for the business. Uh, it was a market success. We built great technology. We marketed it. We we, we did really well. Um, but you know, sitting there waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on on the life of your business, like literally the Grokster case, I, I I'll never forget it. We were sitting in our office, and um, it was like the day that the judges were going to read off their opinion, and Jed was sitting with his finger over like the return key on his keyboard. And he's like, should I take the site down? Because they ruled against us. The Supreme Court was like nine to nothing. File sharing is illegal. And he's like, so what do I do now? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, should you take the site down? Should you like leave it up? Like, are the feds coming in like five minutes later? Like, I just didn't know. And you know, those are, those are like, those are moments that, um, you know, are, the yeah. kind of decisions you don't ever want to have to make as a CEO. And by the way, not that irrational when you see what happened to Kim.com and all these crazy. I know, I know. It's like it's it's serious stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, and of course there are, you know, there's a feature of the of copyright law that makes um, that makes executives of businesses. But you basically pierce the corporate veil. So if you run, really, yeah, if you run a company that that um, that that does copyright infringement, you can be personally liable, and it's all kinds of, of mess to that. So wow. um, so we got out of that business uh, pretty quick, pretty quickly. <laughs> um, uh, but again, it's one of those things. But, but you know, it, it was, you know, we could have sued. You know, we could have stayed in and litigated. And, and LimeWire did. Um, they litigated for five years. But we kind of looked at each other and said, technology's moving so fast. Um, and this sort of, again, to the litigation point I made earlier, we could have spent five years and probably five, $10 million litigating our case in court. But for what? For what? What, what, what do you win? In five years, you're, you're out 10 million bucks. You probably haven't developed your technology as fast as the competitors and all the, the sort of evolution. And so you win, but then you've lost. So what do you win? Right, exactly. What do you win? And so we basically just said, you know, what, what, what's the point? So we just kind of like threw in the towel and just moved on to other things. Wow, what a chapter. So how do you recover from that first? Like, what, how do you sort of, because that had to be just draining. Incredible. Yeah, it, it, was, it was more emotionally draining than anything else. Um, yeah. There was a, uh, there was, I'll never forgive the USA Today for this. The USA Today wrote, uh, wrote, a, wrote a story uh, which, uh, the first sentence, Sam Yagan's critics call him a child pornographer, comma, and then a bunch of other stuff which didn't matter. Um, and I was like, what? And I'll never forget, my mom calls me. She's like, what? And, and like, we had a three hour conversation about, like, she's like, don't do it. She's like, it's not worth it. I'm like, mom, I'm not, I'm not a child pornographer. Don't worry about it. You know, but it's like, I was like, who's, who writes, who leads an article off? Right. Off that way, but like so, yeah. Look, there there was a lot of um, there was a lot of a uh, lot of uh, challenge there. But look, ultimately, I think 
the good thing about our industry, um, you know, in the in the sort of the tech world is you're as long as you fail the right way, like no one expects you to succeed all the time. And so like people said, look, you built a, you did a lot of great things here, it didn't work out, you know, go back at it. And did you feel that right away, or did it take time for that to sink in? Um, you know, I, I think I felt it. Um, I think I felt it right away. Uh, I was actually just relieved to have the, the. The good thing is, it took it took a year from the time we got sued to the time we settled. And so in that year, I had already gotten back together with my Chris and Max, my uh, and Christian, um, our uh, OkCupid founders, and we had already sort of gotten OkCupid in the works. And so there really wasn't much. There wasn't a time where I was just like sitting alone eating Ben and Jerry's, wondering what I was going to do next. And so, talk about the founding of what, what was the genesis of founding OkCupid? Uh, so I'm sitting in my uh, sitting in my apartment in New York. It's a Friday night around Thanksgiving. Is like a, I guess now that I think about it, a lot of important things in my life have happened around Thanksgiving. Um, it's kind of week after Thanksgiving, um, and I get a call from my friend Chris. It's a Friday night. He's like, "Yo, dude," which is how he often greets me. I'm like, "Hey, Chris," <laughs> and you can tell he's like in a loud bar. He's like, "So we should make a dating site." And he's clearly drunk. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, and he's like, and, he, and I was like, okay. And he's like, here's what it's going to do. It's just going to be a button. It's going to be the blind date button. And you click it, and we give you a blind date that night. I was like, okay. And I like, he's like, fine. And uh, so I hung up, and I remember saying to, you know, my roommate, and I was like, whatever. Chris is crazy. And so he actually, so I, was like, I was like, okay, well, call me tomorrow if you want to talk. And so he actually calls me tomorrow. Saturday. He's like, so what do you think of my idea? And I'm like, you're not serious. And he's like, no, we should totally do this. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, so we got <laughs> together, and um, it turned out that a blind date button is not a great idea to launch a dating site. And so we kind of like, but it was like the inspiration was he was like, we got to do dating. And see, but this is interesting. So, but the big idea of the blind date, so talk about how you learned that was. That oh, I, well, you know, I think we, you know, we just did some really basic math, which is like, in order to be able to actually, you know, for you, for us to be able, the liquidity you would need to be able to give you a blind date tonight with someone who is of the appropriate geography, gender, mm -hmm. age, et cetera, you'd like, you'd need so many people. Um, so we're like, okay, well, that's not going to work. But then we just started thinking about the, the category more. And we said, okay, well. So that was just the trigger to get Yeah, that was the everyone. trigger that really made us start thinking about it. And, um, uh, and, and once, we, once we started thinking about it, we saw, again, kind of what I said earlier in this talk, there was, you know, there wasn't a lot of innovation happening. Um, um, there was a lot of innovation happening, and, and we kind of really worked on a different product that we were excited about, and it was much more around using math uh, to, help, to help get you dates. So you, um, you get together, and talk about those early days, like the first product, trying to get users, because this, this is a company that, you know, well, you know, our friend Troy uh, Hennikoff always likes to say, you know, the, People look at the beginning and the end of where you are, and they, they draw a line between and call it a hockey stick. Right. And of course, it feels more like the interday trading chart. Yes, yeah, that's for sure. Um, so the early days were, were largely around really sort of solidifying what our, what our product was going to be. Um, and, um, and again, Chris sort of is the, is the product inspiration for, for it. And you know, he kind of came up with this matching algorithm for how we were going to match people together. And that, to this day, is kind of OkCupid's okay, core differentiator. Um, is that we think we can predict compatibility better than better than anyone else, um, and so there there was that piece. But then there was also the piece about like how are we going to get users? Um, and uh, you know, again, you have to take yourself back to 2004. MySpace was the dominant social network at the time, and um, you know, people had widgets um, on their MySpace pages, and um, you know, we really came up with some really great ideas about having these. We had this Myers, we had this test called the online dating persona test, which was basically a Myers Briggs for dating. And there were four axes, and you'd get one of 16 personality types for guys and 16 personality types for girls. And the personality types were both really, really accurate and really, really funny. And so we literally would have, we had millions of people take this test um, and then put it on their MySpace page. And so in the same way that people now will use, you know, Facebook, the Facebook platform to sort of drive engagement, um, we used the MySpace platform before it even wasn't, it wasn't actually a platform, of course, but we used MySpace as this, as this way to drive viral growth. And so we got our first half a million users, all uh, largely from people promoting our content on MySpace. Wow, how long did that take? Um, it, it took a good, it took a good uh, year or so, maybe a year and a half. It's still incredible. Um, and you know, when we, when we launched, we launched as a, as a personality testing site. There wasn't any dating. You couldn't date because you have, dating has this big problem of liquidity. Right. And every dating startup you know, that comes and talks to me, I'm just like, it's all about, can you get to the first 100,000 users? Because if you have a dating site with 10,000 users, you might as well have not a dating site not enough. Um, 
And so for the first year and a half, we were really just a personality testing site. We were sort of collecting people's, collecting a lot of data about people. Sort of before we knew big data was a thing, we were big data. Um, so we had all these users and we had all this data about them, uh, but we didn't let them see each other. And then right around January of 06, we sort of pulled up the curtain and we did a big site redesign. And instead of coming and saying, take this quiz, we said, hey, come look for people like you. Um, and that was going to be a dating site. Interesting, interesting. So we have a totally different way. It's a numbers game. It's four Harvard math majors. Um, you get really good early traction, but you know it's, it, it wasn't the hockey stick all the way to the end. So what happened? Um, so I, somewhere in here, I went to business school um, while I was doing eDonkey um, and at the beginning of OkCupid. So I just so 2005 comes around. So you, you went to Stanford Business School yeah. in the middle of all this. I did. I did. And that's because I have incredibly flexible co-founders who were like, I don't care where you are, just like, you know, business school's only a few hours a day, right? I was like, yeah, of course, <laughs> just a few hours a day. Um, and so, uh, so I was doing, I was kind of moonlighting um, uh, at the time, which was, uh, I was so fortunate that they let me do that because that gave me, I think they ended up being benefited by having a, you know, a partner who, a co-founder who, you know, had a Stanford MBA, but um, it's great for them to let me do that. Um, oh, so I had just graduated from business school in the Valley and had all this, you know, big, VC networks. I was like, oh, let's go raise, let's go raise venture capital. Um, and so I went out on this sort of big quest to, to raise money in the, in the spring of 06. And um, I could do a whole talk about, about this, but um, I did something like 24 meetings uh, in one week in the Valley, which was a mistake. Uh, bad idea. You should beta test your pitch uh, on a couple of unsuspecting uh, uh, people before you go and go all out with your full 24 meetings. Um, we, got, we got some good term sheets from really, really top tier uh, blue chip firms. And, um, and, uh, and despite the fact that I had said in all the meetings, like, I don't want to raise a lot of money. This is, this is the only round I want to raise. I want to get to profitability. I want to get to, want, this is enough. Um, I'll never forget, I'll never forget. So we'd, we'd gotten this term sheet from this firm and they were like, you know, come in and let's talk about it. So they walked us through the term sheet. And, there were two things that they really, really focused on. They focused on number one: we've reserved fifteen million dollars in our fund for your next round. And now I'm now I understand a what that means and why they did that. But at the time, I was like, it's exactly the opposite of what I told you. Um, and b, they said, as, as part of their way to convince me they were going to work really hard for me, they said, um, and this was like a really, really great partner at the firm, but he was a junior partner. He said, I think OKCupid is how I'm going to make my name in the valley. And he thought that was going to sell the deal. And I had this red-eye flight uh, back from California to, to New York, and I couldn't sleep the whole time. So that phrase kept ringing in my head. And I'm like, I got problems. I got my own problems. I got users. I got employees. I got revenue. And now I got to make this guy's career? You know, like, I, 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 need, I need that on my list of things to do? Um, and it was this moment of clarity that I had that I said, we cannot take institutional capital because their incentives are totally aligned. You've got like the partner's incentives that aren't aligned with what I want to do. You've got the, the, the amount of capital they want to put into this business. It's not what I want. Um, and so we ended up just walking away from the term sheets and just saying, that's not for us. Hmm. Um, and so how do you fund the business? And so we set out to raise an angel round. Um, and again, you have to, set, to take yourself back in time. In 2004, there wasn't angel investing like there is today where there's this kind right. of a mature thing. that It's like almost a, it's almost a most deals get angel funded at some point now in their, in, their, in their progression. At the time, angels were really only getting, there was a huge adverse selection problem in the, in the angel market. And in other words, if you could get blue chip capital, you got blue chip capital. And otherwise, the dregs went to angels. And so I was able to go, again, to my Stanford network, four out of the five investors we had were, were, from, were Stanford alums. I was able to go and say, look, we have this term sheet from fancy blue chip firm that you've heard of. We're not taking it. We're going to charge you a 20% premium because you're not a blue chip. You don't have a name. But otherwise, we'll give you more or less the same terms. And they were like, oh, we can invest in a, in a Sand Hill Road quality deal. Um, we'll do it. And so we raised a $6 million angel round, which it's a big angel round. It's a big angel round. It was really a big angel round in, in 2004. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, and you know, that, that took us uh, you know, about 90 days to raise. Um, so we spent about three months raising the, the institutional round and then walking away from it, and then about three months raise, raising the angel round. Um, and you know, it was great, especially because we had to, you know, the crash comes two years later, and if you like, look at the history, most venture funds, basically, they, they basically took all their losers and shut them down or, or 
merge them into their winners. And then the winners they crammed capital into at low prices. And so it, it was very hard for entrepreneurs to sort of bridge the, the 08 crash to come out alive. And um, you know, we ended up returning five, we ended up returning 5x to our, to our angel investors, which is not a great outcome. Um, for an institution, it would be an okay outcome. Um, but for an angel, you know, we have an angel who put in two million bucks, and it was that ten million bucks. Yeah, he was like high five. Exactly. You know? He was like, "That's who awesome. buy you dinner." Yeah, he still he still does to this day. Um, but you know, it, it, it ended up being, and, and that's why again, it's something I focus on with the tech stars companies. It's like who you get capital from, and and on what terms. It's super important. Mm -hmm. Super important. Um, and so again, I'd like to say that was like genius on our part. I think it was a lot of luck that you know he said like if he hadn't said if the partner hadn't said those exact words that really resonated with me. To really reflect on, I probably would probably take that deal. And without naming names, did he make his his career his name in Silicon Valley? Yeah, another yeah, company? yeah. He's 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 super successful, and you know we you know we're on good terms, and we grab beers, you know whatever. I'm in town, and and he's like, look, you made the right decision. Now, he, yeah. So, <laughs> so where does it get lean? Because this I know this story gets hard. It gets hard. So. Um, in, in, so we raised, we raised $6 million in 2006. Everything's great. Um, and, uh, you know, but there's this expectation of hockey stick, um, especially for consumer companies that, you know, that don't have sort of big, you know, sort of business models outside of ad revenue, which we didn't at the time. Um, and so the growth wasn't coming. And, uh, you know, I think as we look back in retrospect, I think it's fair to say we, we lost our way. Um, we lost confidence in our own abilities. I think we, you know, we had a track record from Sparknotes and from the first three years of, of OkCupid that we can build great product and build organic traffic. Um, but it wasn't happening at the rate that we wanted. So we set out on a couple uh, attempts to sort of jumpstart growth. The first was that we went international. We said, look, if it's, not, if, it's not working, okay, if it's not working in the US, let's go do this personality quiz in 20 markets Hope it catches in four or five of the markets, and you'll have a big German business, and you'll have this, and you know maybe you'll get hockey sticks sort of in other places. Um, it's a complete disaster. Uh, we got zero. We got not even a hockey puck. We got nothing. We got zero, um, and that, that was bad. Um, and then um, we actually fulfilled Chris's dream of the blind date button. We launched something called Crazy Blind Date, um, but we launched it. I think this is 2007. So this is pre-smartphone. So we got this short code Cupid. And imagine, imagine the user experience on your old flip phone oh, yeah. of setting yeah. up a blind date. It's bad. <laughs> it's just bad. Um, now, we, we, th we think about it. We got 10,000 dates to happen in that year. Um, uh, and the first thing I did every morning when I came to work was I would read the reviews of the blind dates, and they were awesome to read. Um, they'd be like, you set me up with a lunatic, but she was great, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know. You set me up with my sister. You set me up with someone who went to jail. Like, literally, we got everything. You set me up with my boss. We literally got all four of those, um, which I was like, OK, this is the. I have a friend who got set up with his ex-wife on JD. Oh, perfect. That and well. Perfect, perfect. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so it was great. It was great fodder for, uh, for my you know, morning coffee. Um, but, um, but as a, you know, it, it, it got to 10,000 users. We got a ton of press, uh, 10,000 dates. But um, that wasn't a business either. And so, you know, we're kind of plugging along in uh, 2008, uh, and A, we start getting low on cash, um, and B, uh, the market crashes. And so things got... Uh, that was a scary time. It was a very scary time. Uh, it was, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, a little bit, you know, necessities of other invention, or, or, yeah, I guess that's how the phrase goes. And so it certainly forced us to focus. So, like, we stopped doing these other things. We said, okay, well, we have to get dating in the US to work, or else we don't have a business. So it really focused us. Um, it focused us on um, revenue. I like, starting, in, starting after the crash, I did nothing but ad sales you know, for, that, for 2009. It was, that was it. Um, I had a spreadsheet called GBD for GoBrokeDate.xls uh, sitting there, because uh, I didn't want any employee to see it and figure out what GoBrokeDate meant. Uh, so I thought I'd be tricky. Um, but we had six weeks of cash in the bank. Wow. Uh, we, got down that, we got down that low. Um, and. Um, what was what was the dynamic then amongst the founders? The dynamic was um, well, it was, it was several fold. It was first, you know, what is you know, what how do you write by our employees? I think that was sort of one of the first things we were thinking about. Is like these are all people who I know we we felt a very 
a very personal connection to, uh, because the only reason they were working there was because they believed in founders, as, as most people who join startups do. Um, so that, that was a big part of it for us, but also it was obviously a business. We're like, well, how do we keep this thing from, from going under? Um, and so part of that was just a revenue. So I was able, we sort of squared that on. We were able to get enough revenue and, and sort of start to make some accounts receivable. So there, there was some sort of cash management effects that we were able to just kind of get us through that particular hurdle. Um, but more than anything, it focused us on saying, okay, we really, really, really have to figure out um, uh, this growth. And so we started, um, we realized that the data we had would be a great marketing tool. Um, and so we started, uh, we started sort of putting out little, little press stories about, um, about using our data to tell compelling stories. One of my favorites is we found out that um, as gas prices go up, people narrow their search radius on dating sites. Fascinating. But it's, but it's both obvious and fascinating, which is the best kind of data sort of infographic stuff to do is the stuff that's both fascinating and, you know, that kind of makes you know, sense. gels with you. Yeah. Um, and so we started, like, blasting these out to the reporters. And invariably, they were like, it's great, I'm not writing a story about gas. Or great, you know, I'm not writing a story about this thing that you're, that you're talking about. So we're like, so we, like, we knew there was something there. We we're like, there is a story. Our data is powerful. It can tell a really great story. Um, but we're not doing it right. And so that was when the idea of having, and it sort of parallel, we were like, we should have a blog, because people were blogging in 2009. I was like, we should have a blog. And so we had this sort of two threads in our heads. One was about have a blog, but what's it going to have on it? And two, this data thing isn't working in its current formation. And so we started this idea of having a data blog. Um, and I don't want to take credit for making, you know, being the first to do it, but we were one of the first to really make sure. you know, these data blogs and infographics. I know, I know a ton of people who've never used a dating site. But they know okay, this blog. They know the blog really. Yeah. Um, and so we started doing that, and the blog took off. You want a hockey stick? We finally got our hockey stick. You know, seven years into into uh, okay, Cupid, we got the hockey stick, and people loved the blog. They couldn't stop sharing it. They couldn't stop. The, the press was insane. Um, we were we were on the front page of a New York Times section three times in the span of like eight weeks, I think. Wow. Um, because everyone was like, "This is this is amazing. This is." There's a voyeuristic effect to dating. People always wonder, like, how do other people date? It's like something that you don't always talk about, but you always kind of want to know. And so um, knowing that iPhone users have more sex is a great thing for people to know. Um, and, you know, it's, it's um, you know, uh, I know everyone's checking their, their neighbor. Uh, um, uh, no more jokes. Um, um, whenever I do corporate events, I always have a good, really good shtick around uh, everyone hold up your phone. And, um, <laughs> Anyway, so, um, oh, so we have this blog, the blog's taking off. Um, now, I've moved back to Chicago somewhere in this story. So in 2007, I moved back to Chicago because I'm going to start a family, and my parents are here, and my wife's family are from Southern Illinois. So I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to raise a family in Chicago, in, in New York. So we moved to Chicago. And of course, my co founder is so nice to let me commute and, and, and move out. Um, but it just, the blog's doing great, but, but we're, and we're, and for the first time, and we've worked together for 11 years, and for the first time, we start having tension among the founders. It's just like, not finger pointing, but just like no one's having fun. Um, and I think, and I think a sort of a separate whole thing to talk about is like, I think to someone who hasn't been an entrepreneur, at, from the outside it all looks like you know unicorns and candy can and you know and and, uh, and and candy bars. But you're just like it sucks. There's so much part, so much of entrepreneurship that sucks that you don't see until you're in it. And we were in one of those ruts where it was like we were arguing with each other a lot. And again, not finger pointing, but just saying like this isn't working, and no one had the answer. Right. Well, Brian Johnson from Brain Trainers here. He said, tell me about, we talked about being a founder, and he said, entrepreneurship can be soul-crushing work. And someone commented later, well, he's not going to be a successful. Of course, he's done very well subsequent to his time here. Yeah. It's a billion-dollar sale. Yeah. But, you know, I think if you haven't lived inside of it, you don't know what that means. If you have, you, you can identify with this. Of course, you're on the wrong side of that pain at that time. Yeah. And that was part of why he got a successor in it. You know, I think that you got to be able to know that. John Aiello, who founded Savo, was the same yep. thing. He's like... I have to, you know, his dad was sick, and he's like, he's taking stock of his life, and he was just super burned out. And I think sometimes people don't understand, it's not like another job. Right. Yeah, and, uh, and I think there are a lot of implications. Like, you, can, you know, it's, it's like in maritime law, like the captain of a ship, like you're not supposed to leave the ship until a sinking ship, until every person's off. And there are a lot of parallels to that in some cases. Like, I couldn't have just left you I got six weeks of cash in the bank, good luck, guys. I'm out. Right. Like, you, can't, you just can't do that. You have to stick around. Employees can just give two weeks notice and walk out. Investors can focus on their other investments, but you're the founder, and you have, it's your job to see its resolution. Um, anyway, so we had this, uh, January of 2010, we have this all-day meeting at our 
at an offsite, which we chose our lawyer's office, which was a bad place for an offsite. There were like no windows and <laughs> sitting in this like very formal office for the day. And we just we made the decision there that we, by the end of 2010 we were going to leave. The founders were all going to leave the business, and we were going to spend 2010 transitioning to our lieutenants. So the number two uh, guy in the dev group was going to become CTO, and the new guy was going to write the blog, and the new guy was going to become the, the, the GM. Um, and we were all just going to like let this thing ride for 10 years, and maybe it'll you know maybe it'll just slowly grow into something, but we just had it. We were done. Um, and that's um, why I was involved in starting Accelerate, was because I, I was like thinking about like, okay, well, we're leaving, um, and, so, and so sort of that timing worked out really What's well, which, which, which we can talk about. Um, and so, and, and that's just, we had made the decision to leave in January of 10, and the business took off. Um, Hopefully unrelated, but unclear. Um, <laughs> so, so the business takes off, and um, and we get and, and so and, and so we did agree. I said in that meeting, I said, look, let me just take one shot uh, at trying to sell the company this year. So that I said that'll be look, I'll do revenue and all this other stuff, and I'll transition. But I'm also going to take a real shot at selling this company. Um, and so I was super proactive about it, and really, you know, kind of, and I did it myself, no banker at this at this point, and I was like, I'm going to just go convince somebody to buy our company. Um, and so I had met, so in this year, I met the CEO of Match, the CEO of eHarmony, the CEO of Spark. Um, and without, sell, without trying to sell the company, was trying to sell the company. And um, we managed to get our first offer um, in August of that year. Um, and that started a whole new process. Wow. So you get, you get going with that. Um, just shift gears for a minute. Sure. So your story, you talk a lot about living in New York during your story. Um, and obviously you lived out in San Francisco, or in, in, in Palo Alto. Um, love to get your thoughts on, one, you're, you're obviously an incredibly successful and prolific entrepreneur. Um, was there any temptation to, or, or, or call to want to uh, stay in the Bay Area after school? No, um, I think because, um, well, for a couple of reasons. I think number one, um, personal reasons for wanting to be in, in, uh, in Chicago. Two, my co-founders are all in New York, and so I think if I was going to go somewhere else to start a company, I'd probably go to New York to be with them. Number three, and I don't know if it's that I'm jaded, I, I don't know, I'm an old curmudgeon, I don't know what it is, but like, there's something about the, the, the hype like, of San Francisco um, that, that, is, that is inauthentic to me. And I'm not saying it's bad, and I'm not saying that if I didn't grow up there, I wouldn't be just as, part of, just as big a part of that. Um, but the idea that everything is always the best and the biggest, and it's the constant change to the, the flavor of the week. And if you're only working at the third best company, that sucks because you're not working at the first best company and my company's bigger than, I just don't, I, there's a, either a competitiveness or a, or a or, you know, I don't know. There's some, there's, there's, there's some vibe that, just, that isn't authentic to me, that doesn't work. Um, and so I, I just don't, I've just never felt at home there in that. And, and again, I have tons of friends there and I, invest in a lot of deals out there, and, and we have an office out there, and so I love it. I'm not, I don't want anyone to take that the wrong way, but as a place for me to, to be, just never felt, never felt right. It's interesting. We, we looked at opening an office for our second startup, and we had to get more engineers in uh, Austin or, or, or San Francisco, and Austin, the people really want to build companies, and they've stayed with us through thick and thin, and I got out there, and I was talking to a good friend of mine. He said, I learned you to great people. He said, but the first speed bump you hit, recognize, they're not, this, this not monogamy is not a, a thing that a lot of employees do out here. And look, I, th I, th I think the, um, I think the the moving around from company to company, I think is great for the ecosystem as a whole. I think the fact that you can't enforce non competes, I think, is part of why you get so much cross pollination of businesses. So it's great for the ecosystem, but I think right. it's bad for any individual company in the ecosystem. But the net benefit of the ecosystem outweighs sure. the you know all the churn that you have. So it, it, it's 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 just really complicated, I think, to. If you're Facebook or Twitter, that's great. If you're sort of median, median startup, I think it's really tough. Talk, talk a little bit about New York and your experience in New York and what it was like doing companies in New York, uh, given that you've you know, obviously done a number. I know your office is out there as well. Yeah, I, you know, I think I've seen New York evolve through, I don't want to draw too tight of a comparison between Chicago and New York, but, you know, I first moved to, to New York in 2000, um, where it was still way behind and it, it still is behind San Francisco now, but it's, it's probably it's the clear number two now, I think, the market for startups. And I think at the time it, it wasn't. It was still finance and, and whatever else. Um, so I, I sort of witnessed the sort of the, whether it's the tech meetups and it's the, you know, the venture firms start. It used to be covered out all out of Boston. There weren't, like Union Square was there, but there were only a handful 
of New York based venture funds. Right. And it was just, oh, the Boston guys will do it and it fly down. And, um, uh, and so, so I kind of saw, I, I got to see a lot of that take root. But really, it comes out, like anything else, it comes out to having um, both, I think you need two things for an ecosystem to really take hold. You need a handful of crazy outlier successes and you need a mass of quantity. Um, they don't have to be that great, but they have to be enough stuff just for volume. You need volume for the mill, and you also need the outliers for, you know, for having the successful entrepreneurs, the people that you can pull people out of to start the next company. When there's a big exit, you have a lot of people with liquidity and whatnot. Um, and, I, and I saw that happen, you know, whether it was double click or whether it was, you know, all the various, um, you know, successes that have been there. Uh, I think that has a huge effect on, on there, there's a snowballing effect. That takes and what do, you, what do you think things they did well that you look at and say, or that worked well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think more than anything, it is, um, and again, I, I don't know whether, because there was, certainly was no 1871 equivalent, you know, certainly at the time. I mean, obviously now there, there, there are. Um, but I think, it, I think more than anything else, it was just, it was just literally having startups there. Like, there, there's, no, there's nothing better than just actually having real in the flesh startups that are hiring people and raising money. And there's, a, there's an article I saw, uh, Economy or someplace today, it was one of the interesting things they said was that, you know, New York, um, this idea that, you know, New York needs billion dollar companies that not just exits, and that this idea that, that they're kind of, since double click, they've kind of struggled with that. Do you see that as true? Do you think that that's an important part of the ecosystem? And if, if they haven't been able, if it, that hasn't happened, is that about to happen? Oh, yeah, well, why I, has it I mean, look, I think having companies that remain independent and sort of permanent is important. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're starting to see that now with having more, you know, IPOs and, 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 um, and stuff like that. So I think that's all good. Um, I don't think I can speak to the specifics of whether New York's kind of on the verge of that. I know I spent a lot more time here than I do there. So I'm, I'm definitely further apart from that in terms of where they so are. So what would you say about where Chicago is? You've had a lot of perspective, a lot of experience. Where, would you say, where do you feel like, what are the good things happening and what are the things we I, have to really ha need to happen here to help it? I'm, I moved here at the end of 07 and I knew literally zero people. Um, my first introduction was made, uh, <laughs> show you how, sort of how far I was from the next closest person here. The first introduction was made from a friend in Guatemala who was like, oh, I know this guy who's a VC in Chicago. I should introduce you. And so that was like my, my closest path to someone was via Central America. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that was my first meeting here. And I, I went back and checked my email because I, I gave a talk actually here um, a while ago. And uh, in the first 12 months of living in Chicago, despite my attempts to meet people, I had exactly eight meetings Wow! in 12 months. You can have eight meetings walking through 1871 now. Um, but in 2007, that was, maybe I'm a bad networker, I don't know, but that was my ability to network in this town was eight meetings in, in a year. Um, there was no Groupon, there was no Accelerate, um, there was no 1871. Um, and so I think we've come such a long way. I mean, I think now, I, mean, I make eight introductions a week, you know, for people. So I know that the velocity of, of meeting people is much higher, obviously, here. Um, so, so again, I, I think there is, there is the, there's becoming the mass of startups that you need, and there's becoming the outlier, outlier successes. And I think that's, that's, that's what it takes. I think you need those two things. Well, it's nice to see Grubhub public. They're my first guests here, and they. Uh, you also see it though. Back before we saw, it, we did the first dinner for CEC, what is now 18, 1871, and I, I chaired the dinner that night, and we had no idea how many people would come, no idea. And we had it at the Ritz Carlton, and we thought we might have ten tables. Like the people in this room, we'll try and bring their companies, and that'll be it. And we actually ended up. That was your Sava won the momentum award. And we ended up with a satellite room where you had to see it oh, on. That's great. on it. And what you realize, and people stayed, the after party there, people stayed really late and were just all networking. What you saw was Chicago's so big and so spread out. People forget that the Bay Area wasn't always the Bay Area. It was you know, Palo Alto right. and Palo Alto and Menlo. And it was a very concentrated right. area. Sand Hill Road, literally one road had all the, right? had all the VCs. And the diversity of industry here, the scale, two million people come downtown to work. I mean, it's you know, the whole thing. And what you realized is that people, there was, there was diseconomies of scale. There was no way to connect as a community. One of my, one of my favorite stories along that line is um, when, we did, when we were doing Accelerate, we had, um, the, we had this meeting. We, we threw this, um, this happy hour or whatever, this cocktail hour. And the point was for mentors to meet the companies. But that was the whole point. Right? That's why we do these things. Um, and I vividly remember, and I was new, so I was very new to the scene. I vividly remember like, the mentors all shaking hands, like, introducing themselves. And I'm like, you guys don't know each other? How do you know each other? And like people who were 
both VCs or people who were like great entrepreneurs hadn't ever met right. except through Accelerate. That's why I was like, we're doing, we're not just helping these companies, but we're also helping to bring the community together in support of these companies. And That's exactly right. I, so, so I think, uh, but again, those days are now, I think, way behind us. And I think it's so easy to, to meet people and the network is much stronger. So talk just briefly about how you, how you founded Accelerate. Um, and for, I should say, I co-founded, I was probably the least important of the, of the co-founders. Um, the, the, the story there is, uh, is again, you have to go back in time. 2009, um, Techstars had two campuses. They had Boulder and they had Boston. And they had 19 companies go through their program that year. And of those 19 companies, five were from Chicago. So a quarter of the entire Techstars class wow. was Chicago companies. Um, and that was, first of all, shocking that we had 25% of all the good startups in the country came from Chicago. Nobody believed that. But then there was this terrible tragedy. They were all leaving. They were gone. Um, and if you think back to our Illinois history, you know, um, Yelp co-founders were from here, Netscape, you know, all the PayPal engineering team from here, like YouTube founder from here. Like, we have a great tradition of, of innovation and entrepreneurship, but everybody leaves. Right. Um, and I was seeing this, I was, I was seeing this happen. Uh, well, not just I, a bunch of people were seeing this happen. And so, I don't even, but a bunch of people started having these meetings, get, getting together, and Troy was involved, and Kapil was involved, and, uh, and uh, Sandbox Industries was involved, I2A. Uh, we're all getting involved in terms of, well, what do we do? Um, and sort of thought one was, let's, this is before I was involved, thought one was, let's get Techstars to open Techstars Chicago. And Techstars said, look, we've got a long list of cities we're going to get to before Chicago. Um, and they said, okay, that's understandable. Um, and then the second idea was, okay, well, let's try to build something here. Um, and it turns out, Really, to, to run an accelerator, you need two things. You need a little bit of capital, and you need a leader who can recruit companies. Right? Because if you're a company, yes, the brand, I guess now, now that Techstars and Y Combinator have established such good brands, you just go for the brand. But at the time, you're going because the person who's running it. You're going because Paul Graham is great. You're doing it because David Cohen is great. Um, and I'm not at all great. It's just that this is a hard job to fill because it's a job that doesn't pay. It's a job that um, lasts for only 12 weeks. And it's a job that um, you have to do all the work, not all because you have co-founders, but you have to do the work of inventing what this, so you have to start a company for 12 weeks and make no money. Not surprisingly, there wasn't a long line of people <laughs> out the door who wanted this job. Um, and so I got, I got a call and, uh, and they were like, you know, I know you want to get more involved in Chicago. Is there any way you can free up your summer a little bit to, to do this? And again, my co-founders were, again, we'd already decided to leave, so that's the context there. And I said, look, Guys, as long as I get my work done, are you guys cool if I take a little sabbatical and run Accelerate? Um, and so that was it. And so, so, that, that was, so, so the inspiration to do it was all you know, from, from you know, Troy and Kapil and, and Sandbox and all those people who um, founded it. But I think, I think without having a CEO come in who could credibly recruit companies, the thing never would have gotten off the ground. So Got it. That was my small role in, in Accelerate happening. And uh, we'll go to some questions from the audience here, but I wanted to ask, um, I think a lot of people were surprised to see an entrepreneur take on the job of CEO of Match, which is obviously a great company, but also part of a large organization. How did you decide to do that? How's that been? Um, so uh, we had uh, the, the CEO of, uh, of IAC, which is the, the parent company of Match, uh, came to me. I had about six months left on my, on my time at Match, and I was kind of already beginning to think about what I was going to do next. And um, the CEO of IAC, said, hey, um, are you interested in being the CEO of Match? Um, and I wasn't, I, I was, it wasn't a job I was angling for, for sure. Um, it's not a job I was qualified for. I mean, I think the three things you most have to do to run Match is um, you have to be able to manage a nine-digit marketing budget. I'd never spent a dollar. You have to be able to manage a subscription business that generates almost a billion dollars of revenue. I'd never managed a subscription business. And you have to be able to manage a thousand person public, essentially public company across globally. And I'd never done any of that. <laughs> and so I was like, I don't think you want me to have that job. Like, what, you know. Um, but, but when given that opportunity, I think it was one of those kind of, again, you have to position yourself for the luck, then the, the luck has to happen, then you have to go and execute on it. And I said, this is literally a once in a lifetime chance to get this kind of a platform. And look, I like to, I like to learn, I like to work with smart people solve interesting problems that matter, um, and learn. And that's a great platform to do that. I've learned so much. Um, uh, and stuff that I think will make me a better entrepreneur. I think stuff that makes me a better investor, stuff that makes me a better director and advisor to startups. 
Um, but I've learned a ton, and it's been a lot of fun. So um, top-rated question, top most votes here is uh -oh. the, what is the future of dating apps, match Tinder, or something that doesn't yet exist? People may not know about your involvement in Tinder. So oh, we started Tinder. And, and look, I think, I think that's one of the things that, that I love about um, my job is we're still entrepreneurial. Like, OkCupid okay, is still the same little company in the same office it was in before. Tinder is arguably one of the hottest startups talk there Talk is about, when you, you said, you know, talk about starting Tinder. Everybody may not know that. Share. share. You know, Tinder, um, we, both at Match and at IAC, we are um, big believers in both buying companies when we can, but also launching our own companies. And so we have, um, there are a number of incubators across Match and IAC, and, um, and Tinder, it's so funny. Tinder started as a hackathon. Like, it's not supposed to happen. Like, big companies aren't supposed to have incubators, and incubators aren't supposed to have hackathons. I mean, they happen, like, in the PowerPoints. That's supposed to happen. But it doesn't actually happen. Right. But sure enough, it, like, it happened exactly as you would have drawn it up there. We had an, we, you know, we had an incubator. Incubator had a hackathon. Where was the incubator? Yeah, this, this was in, L, it was in New York and L.A., but these guys happened to be in L.A. Um, and they had a hackathon, and they were like, oh, let's just make a dating product. It'll be cool. And they did the swipe thing, and they were like, oh, let's put it out in the App Store. And they put it out in the App Store, and it took off. And um, I don't mean it wasn't thoughtful and, and hard, but it, was, it wasn't a plan. You know, the plan was they were working on this totally, this e-commerce product, and the dating thing was, was And they worked was for the match. They, it, it was, it was, they worked for the incubator, which, right. was, a, was, which was itself a joint venture. But, um, but yeah, and, and so that, that's how it happened. And so we're still, what I love is that I can be in one meeting planning for earnings call, uh, and I can be sort of, the next meeting after that can be about, okay, well, what are we going to do, you know, how do you scale Tinder? How do you deal with, you know, taking a company that's now got, you know, it's not one of the highest rated. It's number. It's the number one. It's number one app in um, I don't know, like a dozen countries um, in the in the iPhone. And what do you think the program. secret to its success is? Oh, it's so hard to say when things take off like that. Look, it, it 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 the 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 bottom line is that it works. Right, you swipe right a few times, you're going to have a match, and you're going to be able to meet with someone. You know, in a matter of, of of a couple hours. Um, uh, but look, I think it struck a, the, the the swiping gesture really took off at the, at that you know it, was, it really resonated with 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 people and I know the product works. Um, you you give, me, should I answer that question? Which one? The one about what the future of dating is. Yes, sure. I don't have to. <laughs> Go for it. The next one. Um, look, I, I think I think um, I think there are there there are. I'm not saying dating is unique, but. Dating is one of those apps that requires you to actually meet in person with, for it to succeed. And so it is inherently more location, geo, um, proximity and synchronicity are much more important to, to dating than to news or to commerce or anything else, right? Because everything else, you, most of the things you can transact online only. But you ultimately have to meet the person mm -hmm. you're dating in person in a place. Um, and so I think because of that, the idea, f the ability for us to um, really move much more hyper-local in real time is the future. Tinder does that in a specific way. You're going to see Match and keep it doing that um, in their own ways. The problem with new dating startups is getting critical mass is almost impossible. Um, and, you know, if you look at the... the, the you see that in marketplaces. I mean, like in almost all markets. Yeah, yeah, that's liquidity right. Matters. So, um, by the way, you, don't, you sound like a great expert in dating. Your teacher's comments notwithstanding. I guess. You do. Uh, so, one of the questions here is, what startup advice you give gets the most positive feedback from founders? Maybe, maybe, maybe to put that question of post facto, like let, let, let them have a chance to marinate or, or, or follow it. Is there something that you say, boy, I really feel like given this has been valuable and I like to say this a lot frequently or share this frequently? I don't think so. I think, I think most of my advice is so idiosyncratic. Um, you know, to, like when I, when I get involved with the company, I get involved really deeply and, and I think um, so. I think the biggest things are around, but there are things everyone knows. There are things like, you know, choose your funders carefully. Like, how much you raise and when you raise it and from whom really matters. Co-founders, most important decisions you make. But those are all things that I think like, are, are You know, pretty, it's interesting. I think the, but you do get involved deeply. We're investing some companies together through Chicago Ventures. And I, 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 it's actually interesting. Um, sometimes you can hear something. I read a, well, replace, look at it, replace myself as CEO of a company, and they talked about, and Reed Hoffman has a great post on this. Yeah, and I'd read it, and then I, I was with them last summer, and I, we were talking about it after lunch and afterwards. And I really understood it on a different level in mm -hmm. having that to conversation. Yeah, I think it really gave me a, a more profound understanding. And I think that was, that that's why it's, people love having you on the board instead of just, well, I heard Sam said this. Right, right. We always have one final question. 
Um, are there younger Chicago startups that you are excited about that you think could be, you know, um, uh, telling their story on this stage someday? Look, I, th I think there are. Uh, I, f I feel bad. I feel bad naming any of them because, um, you know, look. I, I look at all the. You know, we've graduated 40 companies out of out of Accelerate and TechStars, um, uh, and those are. You can't you can't say love any of your children more. I th those th those I all love. Um, you know, I'm a personal investor in about 20 companies in Chicago. Um, uh, my fund has invested in in seven companies in Chicago. So those are all. Um, so let me ask a all, different all, question. What what companies are you on the boards of? What startups you oh, on the board? Oh, good question. Good question. I'm on the board of Spot Hero, uh, and I know I'm going to forget a company now that uh, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'm on the board of ShiftGig. Um, I'm on the board of uh, Brilliant, which is Sue Kim's company that was EduLender and then was Altuition and now is uh, Brilliant. Um, I'm on the board of a company called Live Minutes, uh, which is uh, based in Palo Alto. Um, It's like naming your kids and naming like all your cousins and name and forgetting one. I'm sure there are others I'm forgetting, um, but no one's screaming. We'll cut it in for the so, video. Yeah, we'll cut it in. Oh, that's we'll cut it in for the video. Yes, yeah, perfect. Well, it's I, I know from the boards you're on. It's uh, I know how incredibly helpful it is, and for all of us here, with those who watch, what incredibly helpful to hear the stories and learn. I got two pages of notes to go back to my team with tomorrow. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks Steve. for having me. Appreciate it.